How's everybody doing? This is our Rapture Sunday, pre-Rapture Sunday, uh, when the church goes to Poconos. Camping. How many of you could handle that? Could you handle the Poconos camping today, huh? What a beautiful day. I always pray that they'll have rain, just because I'm, I'm kidding. I don't do that. I don't do that. I'm kidding. Uh, only because I'd love to be there with them. And uh, especially since Anthony's gone and I'm here in his place. Anyway, if you're here for the first time today, or if you have never uh, filled out a little card, we'd like for you to do that because we have some information about our church we'd love to give you. And you know what we think? We think that you'd like to find out. Is that an assumption on our part? Maybe it is. But anyway, um, we'd like for you to know. And we'd like for you to get the big news this week. What's the big news of the day? What do you think the big news of the day is? It's not Dallas. Don't worry about it. It's not the Dallas and Eagles. That's tomorrow anyway. Uh, the big news of the day is next week, are you ready? The 10-week series on James and 1 Peter starts next Sunday. Yay, come on, let's a little. Um, I'm talking a little bit about that today. But do you have any idea why people, most people don't read the Bible that are believers? Do you have any idea why? What, what would be your first response to that? Why? They don't understand it. Uh, I wasn't going to go there. Lazy, somebody said. Uh, I'll, let, I'll let Anthony take care of that one. Uh, yes, I see that hand. They don't consider it a priority. Well, let's go back. I like the first one the best, and those others are true. They don't understand. So we're going to take that right off of your plate to be able to say you don't anymore. How are you going to do that? Now, don't inquiring minds want to know. How are we going to do that? We're going to do that three ways. Not just one. Not just two. But three. How can you lose with three? Like triple A. Everything's, you know, triple whatever. Here's the way we're going to do it. Number one. We're going to, our pastor who is a great preacher, by the way, just saying. Do you think, I, I got, come on, we get a little more? Thank you. He's going to begin it by preaching on James chapter 1 next Sunday. Oh, that's just the beginning. Then, that week, for the following week, after he preaches on that, then I'm going to send out discussion questions on James chapter 1. After that, we're going to give you a notebook. Come on now. We're going to give you a notebook where you can take notes from the messages that he preaches on Sunday to compare with your devotional notes that you're reading on that chapter during the week and come back the next Sunday... And discuss it in a small group. Can you beat that? That's four of them. Not three, but four. So you may. Now, I'm not promising anything, but you may actually know something about the book of James when you're done. I'm not promising. I'm saying you still got to put your time in to get it. But we're going to try to help you. Best way we can. Never done that before. I am thrilled beyond words with the prospect of seeing people in this auditorium with their Bible open and taking notes on what our pastor is saying. Do you know that's not a very common thing? Which for me is kind of sad. I'm a no not everybody's a note taker and I'm not trying to make spiritual, oh, only the note takers are spiritual. That's not true. Some of you have a photographic mind. 
They used to tell me I had a photographic mind, but it never developed. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. But if you saw my test scores, you'd probably agree. Anyway, um, so that's what is going on, and you can sign up today. We have orange cards right out there on the welcomes. I was, I was so tempted to bring them in here, but I didn't want to put anybody under pressure. Okay, who's looking for it? No, I'm going to uh, Anyway, okay, next Sunday, big deal, big deal. All right, so next. Oh, I got that movie, the film to show too, right, Gary? I'm going to do that right now or I'll forget, promise. I forgot it in the 8.30 service. This is just a little blurb on Operation, Operation. Hi, my name is Zhenya. I grew up Operation in an orphanage. What? Once a okay. month we would drive it's to coming. Hi, my name is Zhenya. I grew up in an orphanage where we once a month we would drive. And between my age group of 30 kids, we shared one bar of soap. So at age of 12, Operation Christmas Child Shoeboxes came to our orphanage. One of my friends, he came rushing to me. He says, hey, you know, you, we got the boxes. <laughs> but specifically, what was most important to me, it had a bar of soap in it and a washcloth. And I specifically remember it was Irish Spring. It was special. But not only that, it was my own. At the age of 14, I was adopted. To, uh, to Texas by a family. And that's where I learned of the people who packed the shoe boxes and their love to give um, to the kids through sh a shoe box. And through that, I knew God was real and he was working to bring love and joy to those kids, the kids who needed. I immediately wanted to get involved with it and I did. I packed two boxes that, that first year, and, uh, and I wrote a letter. And I just simply said, long ago, I received one of these shoe boxes. Jesus loves you. So I hope that you would do the same. love those. Those are so good. So I hope you're going to participate there. The table is right outside those doors and uh, right to the left. Get you a few boxes and start it out. It's really, really simple to be a participant and you never know. I got to tell you, one of the most exciting things about heaven for me is to get to meet the people that I didn't get to meet on this earth that I touched in any way while I was here. Because you don't know. You don't know the smile you gave, you don't know the track you gave, you don't know whatever, uh, you just don't know what God did with it. And uh, so I just want to encourage you to get involved. Okay, the rest of this week uh, for tomorrow is MOPS, Mothers of Preschoolers, and that's at 9.30 right here. And then uh, Bible study for ladies, uh, I think they have 15 signed up. If you, this is a great, great study for giving what you cannot forget. Uh, I've heard, awesome. So it's at 7 p.m. Uh, in the bulletin, Haley Garrier leads the group. In the bulletin is her phone number. Um, and you can call, she wants you to call her so she can order you a book because having the book is a really important part of being uh, a part of the study. So I would just encourage you. And then Debbie is online uh, on Mondays at 7.30, Bible study. Prayer meeting for our ladies, 8.45 on Tuesdays, followed by the group Bible study. Pastor Anthony will be back, and that will be held at 10 a.m. 
on Tuesday. And American Heritage Girls, are you? September 28th. You know what this is about, and it's our Christian answer to the Girl Scouts, sort of, and they do a lot of neat things. And then this is the boys' part uh, on September 28th. Gosh, that's this week. This month. Has it gone fast to you, or am I just... Oh, my word. I thought, oh, that's... Wednesdays, Awana had a great start with our kids. If you can get kids in that, man, my kids, I don't know how many verses they memorized over the years. What a powerful impact. Prayer meeting Wednesday night at 7, impact will be in here. And then our teens meet upstairs on Wednesday nights at 7. Okay, and Addictions Victoria, somebody that you know that's struggling with an addiction, Chris Hughes leads that group, and he will be here on Thursday night. And the blood drive is this coming Saturday. So that's, they didn't give a time. I think it's nine, something in there. And then grief share, anyone that, as you know of anyone, or you're going through a struggle uh, with a loss of a loved one or a friend, uh, great program to encourage you in that way. Okay? All right. Don, mm -hmm. do you guys notice how Robin keeps rocking up here? Anybody notice that? Both of us rocking back and forth. Does that seem a little weird to you? But <laughs> we just constantly have the music running in our brains, <laughs> no matter what's happening. So, so the beats and everything are just just going. So it's hard to just it's hard to just stand still while, while all that's running through your head, but. Let's, let's continue on with our worship. Please stand with us. The blood will never lose its power. The blood that Jesus shed for
again. Woo! 2,000 years ago, Jesus shed his blood for us, and it is still as powerful and strong today. Can you imagine those trying to squelch Jesus back in his day? Little did they know how far his ministry, what God's love, how far it was going to go, how far it was going to take us, and we are still here today being strengthened by the blood of Jesus that he shed for us on Calvary. Amen? Come on, church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for being obedient, going to the Calvary for us while we did not deserve. We deserve death, Lord, but you gave us life and life everlasting in you. Lord, I ask that you be with Gary as he comes and deliver a message for us today that we so desperately need to hear from you. All these things we ask and pray in the mighty, matchless name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. Thank you, Don and Robin. Don't they do a great job? Yeah. I'm always thankful I never have to sing after they get done. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm... I used to, we used to sing, Judy and I used to sing all the time. After I heard them, I said, honey, it's time for, for us to move in a different direction here. Uh, so that worked out real well. We came here and they were here and we got to shut up. So that is a good deal right there. Second Chronicles 34, if you would turn there, please. Second Chronicles 34, just so any of you were wondering about getting in touch Pastor Anthony will be back tomorrow, and uh, all the rest of the crew there. Everybody that's ever moved has told me, I can't believe all the stuff that we had to move out of our house to move. I mean... A lot. Isn't it amazing what kind of, uh, what are we, clutterers we are? Hoarders, there's the other word, hoarders. Uh, I never do watch that program. I, I think I would be depressed if I did because I might be tempted uh, to do, isn't it, you know what's another thing that's amazing to me? The husband and wife, I know we're generally opposite anyway, but the husband and wife are so different on the whole thing most of the time with stuff. Like this is really unusual. So our oldest daughter is in California is a get it out of here if we haven't used it in a year kind of person. Some of you are like that. How long have we had this? What have we done with it? Okay, done. My son-in-law, on the other hand, He'll go back. Do you remember whose that was and who gave that to us and how much that means to me? She's got, oh my word, what have I got here? But everybody has their place, you know. Some are more sentimental than others. But what I really love is finding something that you didn't expect. Like I saw these stories this week. This might encourage some of you that have trouble exercising. This couple, they were out taking a walk. And they found a stash of rare coins worth $10 million. I'm walking tonight. You ain't got a problem with me. I'll be out there on my street. Come by and I'll wave at you, you know. And the, good, the, the crowd this morning was pretty with my jokes. I really appreciate that. So even if you think it's corny, laugh anyway, it really... But maybe you don't want me to go very long, so you might just not laugh. So anyway. But here's a story of another couple. They purchased a bowl, B-O-W-L, a bowl, at a garage sale for $3. I know some of you are saying, i got to hit those garage sales again. Turned out to be a thousand year old piece of art from China. And the buying price, 
$2.2 million. How many of you are going to start garage sailing next week? You thinking about it? <clears throat> or the one that went to the flea market and they bought a painting because they liked the frame. Get that part now. They liked the frame. But behind the canvas, they found one of the original 24 copies of the United States Declaration of Independence. Estimated worth, $800,000. But they sold it for $2.4 million. Yeah. So I think I've changed my ministry now. I think I'm going to leave preaching and go to yard sailing, whatever. Well, we're in Second Chronicles 34, and we're going to talk today about a discovery that was made that changed everything, not just for an individual, but for a whole kingdom. And his name is Josiah. Josiah... Where is Josiah? He's in the house. Raise your hand, Josiah. We have a Josiah in our church, in case you didn't know that. He's all the way in the back today. The only reason he came in is because I told him I was going to be preaching on his name. I'm kidding. That's not true. But anyway, 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and verse 1. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Can you imagine calling an eight-year-old your king? He was eight years old. And that's a good sign for the kid, your kids to let them know it's never too early to seek the Lord. And he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. Verse 2, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, which is amazing because most of these kings didn't. And walked in the ways of David, his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. So you get a little background, and then look at verse 3. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, 16 approximately, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. If you really want a thorough explanation of just how thorough this cleaning was, you can read this in 2 Kings. Second Kings and Chronicles uh, coincide with each other, not the exact chapter, but it's there uh, in 2 Kings of just what was involved in that. But he was getting rid of everything that had to do with idolatry. Now look at verse 8. Now in the 18th year of his reign, approximately when he was 26, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Masiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joah, has. See, that's why you got to go to seminary just to learn how to pronounce the names in the Old Testament. Okay, we had one course. No, I'm kidding. But anyway, uh, and let me go back here. The recorder to repair the house of the Lord his God. So here's a renovation of major proportions. This isn't just a house. This is the temple. This is huge, beyond anything uh, that you've ever seen. And then verse 14 says, And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. Now try to imagine Israel the chosen people of God. This book is their book. It is God's word written for them, and yet for all of these years it laid dormant. They had to find it. 
You don't know any believers like that, do you? You know, what it kind of reminds me of is the couple that invited the preacher over to their house and they wanted to impress him. So he comes into the house, he sits down, she looks at her son, says, son, she couldn't remember his first name, I couldn't either, but he said, son, go into the back bedroom and get that book that we love, that we cherish, that you go through time and time again, that is the most cherished book in this house. And the little kid goes to the back room and comes out with a Sears catalog. <laughs> now, some of you don't even know what that is. How many of you, younger kids, how many of you have no idea what I meant when I said Sears catalog? Raise your hand. You had no idea. All of you did? Oh, in the back. A few teenagers. Thank you for showing today. But anyway, you say Sears catalog and you can't even find the stores anymore. I mean, let alone the catalog, right? But the point is that that's not what they were looking for. They were looking to impress the pastor and they did everything but that. It kind of reminds me of their day. But I want you to notice what happened. Even though it had lain dormant for all of those years, what happened to the king when the book was opened. Look at verse 19. And it came to pass... That when the king, first of all, he read it to them. Let me go back to verse 18. Then Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Now, you notice something. I, I wasn't going to say this, but somebody mentioned this after the early service today. He said, you know, God never revealed his word until he found a king who was looking for it. In his heart. You remember he sought the Lord at eight? And all of that time, all of those 18 years, he had been seeking the Lord but without the book. But when it was discovered, he was ready to receive it. I got something to tell you. I want to mention this to you. Some of you say, I would read the Bible more often, but I just don't get anything out of it. Sometimes it's because you didn't prepare your heart to get anything out of it. I tell people it's very important to pray twice when you have devotions, before and at the end. Before to prepare your heart and the end to thank God for what he showed you and ask him how he wants you to apply it to your life. So don't just pray once, because it's the Holy Spirit who has to teach you what's there for you to get to apply. He's the teacher. So it came to pass, look at how God had prepared his heart in verse 19. When the king had heard the words of the law, that he rent his clothes. He bowed down, that's what it meant. He humbled himself, he wept, as it says in 2 Kings, he realized because of the conviction of God's word how far that they had come from it. Look at verse 21. How far not only he, but Israel as a nation, or Judah, go inquire of the Lord for me, he said, and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah, concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us, because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in the book. Can you imagine a king, the person in authority, so moved and broken by hearing the word of God that he wept? He repented, and it wasn't in private. It was before all the... Can you imagine a person in authority today when people are, are basically scoffing at the word and mocking it? And that's one of the reasons why we are where we are today, by the way. Because as goes our appreciation and love of the word, so goes a nation. That's nothing new, is it? But because of the king's response, 
the whole nation enjoyed 11 years of prosperity and peace. Because when he heard the word, he took it as the word and responded to the word the way that we should respond to the word when we read it from time to time. You know, when God shows us something from time to time, it's, it's a good thing to repent. It's a good thing to say, yes, Lord, you're right, that's me, I'm sorry, please forgive me and restore me to yourself. That's a good place to be. The reason that we're not seeing more movement of the Holy Spirit is because of too many dry eyes and hardened hearts. When's the last time your heart was broken over your sin? When's the last time your heart was broken over a lost loved one? You know, I, um, I like this statement. Someone said that spiritual reform, listen to this, spiritual reform always begins with the rediscovery of God's word. You want your life to change, then you need to rediscover God's word in your life on a daily basis. If you're doing the hit and skip method, you're probably not going to see a lot of change. You know why? Because you're starving yourself spiritually. You wouldn't do that to yourself physically. But you'll go day after day ignoring the word until it picks up dust. I'm not scolding you. I'm not trying to be ugly today. I'm just saying it's a fact. When this book is neglected, so will your life be. Everybody in here wants a new touch from God, I hope. Everybody in here wants to get something fresh from the Lord, but so few people are willing to go where it's at. And they found it. And when they found it, they were broken. And the other statement that this author made, he said, if the American church, listen to this now, if the American church began to read the Bible they love, they might make a positive impact on the land they love. That's powerful. Everybody wants an impact on the land, but nobody wants to go to the resource of where the impact comes from. It's right here. This is it. Doesn't get, you, looking anywhere else, it's an empty search. It's in vain. This they were singing about the blood and the power. The blood and the book. And the Holy Spirit is where the power is. So have you been washed by the blood? Have you been cleansed by the blood before you came this morning? Did you claim 1 John 1, 9 for forgiveness? And did you ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Those are prerequisites. And you know what people tell me? Oh, I used to go to church. I don't get nothing out of it. You know, my question is, right, what would you put into it? Did you get ready to go? You know, you wouldn't go like that if you were going for a job interview. But some, some of us are so sloppy with God's word, we just think God's going to show up like a magic wand just because we said so. Sorry. God didn't show up in this chapter, in this book, until the book was open and the king repented. It could be. You know, we love 2 Chronicles 7, 14, don't we? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their way, then will I hear from heaven. Well, you got to do the stuff before you hear. And that's where sometimes we don't like to go. He also said if Christians all blew the dust off of their Bibles, we'd suffocate in the dust room. That's pretty tough right there. So the point is, I want to encourage you today to come back and rediscover the Word. The impact that this had cannot be measured. Here, listen to these statistics. 
90% of churchgoers agree, I'd like to please God and honor Jesus Christ and all that I do. 90% said they'd like to. Now listen to the drop. 59% said that they thought about biblical truths on a, regular, on a daily basis. So there's a 31% drop from those who want to and those who actually think about it even on a daily basis. But listen to this. Listen to this. This is the key phrase. 19% from 90 to 59 to 19% read their Bible every day. And you wonder why the church is so anemic? You wonder why we can barely give an answer to somebody who asks of the reason with the hope that's within us? Listen, folks, books are great to read, and I read books, but this is the book, and I'm not trying to be trite. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here. I'm just saying, if you're not here, then you're not going to be there where you ought to be, wherever your ministry is, wherever you go. God uses people who saturate their minds with his word. Do you understand that? Words in the Bible like meditate, that doesn't mean to look at it on the shelf. It doesn't mean to think about that would be a good thing to do. Meditate means to get it in your mind, in your heart, and think about it all day long. There's a big difference between reading the Bible and meditating on it. And the only way you're promised success is in Joshua 1.8. It said, blessed are those, they will have success who meditate on the word of God. Does it work? It really does. You say, how do you know that? It worked for me this week. You know, one of the most wonderful things about counseling is when you get counseled in the process. Don't you love that? You're trying to help somebody and you say something. Man, I need to do that myself. You ever done that before? I'm just being honest. I wish I had all my bases covered. I don't. I, I slack up on stuff. Don't want to. Don't try to. But it happens. So I'm going. I didn't even know when this person came for counseling. I didn't even know what I was going to tell them. Because they were really in a mess. I mean a mess. And so, I went to my go-to chapter, Romans 8. Man, if you haven't discovered Romans 8, go there. It's dynamite. It is awesome. So, let me tell you what happened. So, you know what we did? We just started walking around the building. Let's go to Romans 8, and you read it, and I'll comment on it. Started reading it. We got to verse 2. I said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's, that's a treasure right there. Let's go back. You know how many times I had him read it? Four times. You know why? For me, not for them. Because God was doing something in me. You know what he was doing? He was giving me hope. And a declaration that I'm no longer under the slavery of sin. How many times have I read that verse? More than I can count. But for that day, just like he did for Josiah here, it lifted off the page and into my heart. And let me tell you the beauty of it. I, I kept going over it, kept going over it, till I was getting phrases out of it into my mind. And I don't know if this ever happens to you or not, but I have a pretty good idea it does. Have you ever been sitting and you had a good day, and all of a sudden... You, you, it's like your emotion just dumps. It's just like out of nowhere. You didn't think about anything. You didn't do anything. You didn't watch anything. You shouldn't have. It just like goes, whoo. And you know what I did? I caught myself with Romans 8, 2 on the way down. And I said, oh, wait a minute. Where are you going? You don't have to do that anymore. You were crucified with Christ. You were raised with him. Spirit of God lives in you. You've died to your old man. You don't have to give in to that anymore. And all of a sudden, boom, it was gone. Do you understand what I'm saying? When you get the word into your mind and into your heart where you can use it against sin that's working against you, that's when you've discovered the treasure of the word. Until then, you're just listening to somebody else say it and admiring their knowledge, but you haven't gotten it from here to here to here. 
I was rebuking myself. I said, man, this weapon's been right there all the time. Why didn't you use it before? And aren't you glad you've got a faithful God who knows how we are and how quickly we forget, and he just comes right along and says, man, I want to give you some good news. You don't have to go there anymore. And I got great news for you, neither do you. But before you can use that as a weapon, you got to get it in here. You say, I can't memorize this according how desperate you are. If you're okay with your life the way it is right now, and you're making it in your Christian life, then you won't be interested. But when you see somebody that's desperate, and you're desperately trying to help them, and in the process help yourself, it changes everything. you got to get desperate. you got to get hungry. you got to get thirsty. And when you do... Man, I'm telling you, you won't be satisfied with just reading it. You'll actually try to memorize some of it. Oh, my word, are you become a fanatic? It's what he said to do. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against God. That's exactly what happened to me. The word came up and the sin went down. I ought to write a song about that. This man up and the sin. No, that's another song. Anyway. Point is, 18% rarely, never. Now, let me ask you something. So, since sometimes you have a struggle with reading God's Word, I always pictured this myself, because the Old Testament had the benefit of the voice of God. Do you remember reading in those passages where the voice of God spoke? Remember that? What happened to the people? They went down. I mean, flat. Sometimes I really wish that would happen. Some, most of the time I don't. But did you know that this book here is the voice of God? In print. Did you know that? And then when it speaks, it's just as valid as if he spoke vocally. Did you know that? And just as powerful as if he were here to say it himself. So why don't you get in it? Why don't you quit playing? Why don't you quit hoping that somebody's going to come around? Listen, listen. Why are we doing this next study for the next 10 weeks? Because we're doing everything we can to get you in this. We don't know what else to do except stop by your house and read it for you. And that ain't going to happen. I'm sorry. You wouldn't want to see us. I'm not going the other way. But anyway, you would you want to you understand what I'm saying? God doesn't do that, but he sure shows up for you when you're all alone with him and you give him time to speak to you, doesn't he? Aren't you glad when he by the way, he's there all the time because the Holy Spirit's in you all the time. So usually the connection part is our fault, not his. It's like he's saying, hey, listen, if you deal with that sin arm, I could bless your socks off today, but you won't listen to me, and you won't confess it, and you won't repent of it, so I'm sorry. Don't be there today. You get that dealt with, just wait, man. I want to pour out the, the windows of heaven on you. Do you think God loves to give, or do you think he's chintzy? Isn't he so generous? And you know what I can see him doing sometimes? There on the portals of heaven. And he didn't do this, but you know, you got to have an imagination, right? So he's got this cup full of blessing. And he's right there at the end. He's going, hmm? Come on now. Come on. Listen to me. I got something real good up. Oh, no, man. He didn't. Did it? Come on. And he waits again. Just waiting. Just waiting for you to repent just waiting for you to bow down before this book and honor it the way it ought to be on it. That's all I'm looking for. I'm not looking for some big, massive declaration. I'm just looking for a changed, tender heart. Could you give me that? Every time that happened in the Scripture, God showed up. A contrite and a broken heart, he said, I will not despise. You know what the opposite of despising is? It means he won't Turn away from it. He'll be there when we demonstrate that to him. So I want to encourage you to know that every morning or whenever your prime time is, 
God's prompting you to get into the Word. You know that, right? So it's not on Him. Let's get that off the table right away. It's not on Him. But are you following the prompting? You know where the battle is. You know where our battle is, right? The battle of the sheets. You ever heard that? That's in the Scriptures. The battle of the sheets. You didn't know that was in there, did you? (laughs) Yeah, the battle of the sheets. We can't get out from under him in the morning. That's the battle of the sheets. But he's still there. So I had one of those yesterday, a prompting. By the way, you all know what I'm talking about when I talk about a prompting, right? You're in the middle of doing something, and God will just tap you in. Tap you, not a smack, but a tap. I got something I want you to do. How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? And is it usually inconvenient? Have you ever noticed that about God? You're looking at your watch and say, really? Really? So I had one of those yesterday. I was at I live in Sicklerville, the prompt. You know what the prompt was? Go to Hamilton. I usually come here on Saturdays. I didn't have to come because I didn't have any appointments. Go to Hamilton. What for? Go downtown. Why? I want you to talk to people. Really, Lord? This is how bad I am, okay? So all the way down here, I'm thinking, you know what? He wants me to go in that direction, but I bet it's somewhere closer. <laughs> I just know it is. He doesn't want me to go all the way down there. Come on. So I'm looking on the way down. I'm looking. Maybe it's that house, or maybe it's that, or maybe it's that, you know. And sure enough, downtown Hamilton. Parked the car, got my tracks with me. I'm going down the street looking for people. Let me tell you this. This is cool. This is cool. Doesn't he always so bless you when you obey? Come on. You know what I'm talking? You don't see, you don't see how it's going to happen. And so I parked the car. I got my tracks, and I'm looking for people. So I see this young man sitting out in front of the barber shop. Now get this now. Talk about a God of details. So I'm seeing, and I'm zeroing in, not literally. I'm walking down the street to talk to him. And I walk up to him, and all of a sudden, a guy, listen to this, what's the chance? A guy that knows me came out of the barber shop who knows the boy. Hey, Pastor Gary, how you doing? Good to see you. What did that do for me, man? All of the fear just... And I got to talk to the young man for like 10, 15 minutes. All the while, his uncle, I think he is, was encouraging him to listen to what I had to say. Think that might have been a setup? You know what I want to tell you? God's got setups. He really, and he's more concerned about the loss around you than you are. Did you know that? So I left him and I went down the street and I started looking for somebody else. Now get this. This, this is, I love it when this happens. So I'm going down the street and I see this guy sitting at a table. What's the name of that store, honey? And it starts with an M. Menino's. I love that store, but I can never remember the name. Menino's. You all know where Menino's is? The great ice cream. Right on. Isn't that the name of it? What are they? What's the specialty? Yes. And I never can remember that name either. I'm not Italian. Cannoli. That's my excuse. But anyway. So I walk up there, and get this. There's a guy sitting there that has visited our church. And I've been trying to win him to Christ. He's sitting at the table. Now listen to what he said. Because I was battling the Lord when I was leaving the house. Don't, don't do that to me, because I know you guys do the same thing. I said, maybe if I stay here long enough, he'll drop it. You ever had that one? You ever told him that? So he said, no, I want you to go. I said, I called him by name. I said, man, it's so good to see you. He said, yeah, I usually come down here around three, but today it was four. That's when I got there. I told him, I said, you know, this is a divine setup today. He didn't know what that meant. But I said, you're supposed to be here and I'm supposed to be here. And we just had a wonderful time talking, and I got to share with him. He's on the way. He's not there yet. I'm on my way home. I think I'm done. I'm passing a house. God says, there. Somebody from our church. 
and I knew they were going through a, a hard time. I went in, just talking. I said, you know, I, I just wanted to pray with you. So she said, I'm so glad you stopped. I'm really battling depression today. And I really needed a word of encouragement. So I, I use that illustration to tell you, listen to the prompting. The prompting when you get up every day to get into this book. The prompting to speak to somebody when he gives you a little word to do it, even though you may be scared to death. Be prepared. Have these with you. Even if you can't go into a full conversation, you know, I'm so glad I ran into you today. I have something I know that's just going to bless you if you'll take the time to read it. I gave out one of my favorites is the Mickey Mantle track. There was a, a young man with his son getting into a car. He said, I love your baseball hat. That was my key to get in. I love your baseball hat. Have you ever heard? Isn't that a good transition from a baseball hat to Mickey Mantle? I don't know where it comes from. But anyway, I said, I love your baseball hat. Have you ever, you ever heard the story of Mickey Mantle? No. Oh, I said, it's great. You'll love it. He thanked me. Thank you so much. He said, thank you so much. I don't know what God's going to do with that. But you don't know what God's going to do in your heart with the word of God either when you start reading it every day. You have no idea. You may know about that much of what God's plan is for you. And it's going to stay that small until you get into his word to get his plan. By the way, that's where he reveals his plans through his word, and through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. So, I want to encourage you today to rediscover God's word. Rediscover God's word. That which has been there all the time, but maybe for some reason you've been neglecting. And I'm not pointing anybody out. I'm not beating anybody up. I'm saying it happens to all of us. Nobody is exempt. Somehow, I'm praying that our church would have a movement of the Spirit of God to draw our people back to His Word. And they would get so filled with it that they could never walk away from it again. Wouldn't that be great? I, I just want to stay hungry. I want to stay thirsty. Because if I ever get satisfied, guess what's the first thing to go in my life? That's why God keeps you needy. Did you know that? He's not doing it to be mean to you. He's doing it because he loves to serve a good meal. And he loves to watch you eat. And he loves to watch you grow. And he loves to watch you impact other people in his life. I'm going to close with this illustration, okay? Look at Ephesians chapter 4, and I'll be done. Ephesians chapter 4. So why are we doing what we're doing over the next 11 weeks, I want to give you an illustration of that, and then I am done. Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12. Here's the plan, part of the plan for God to grow the church. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some, literally, pastor teachers. Okay, so those are the gifts of those in leadership in the church. We call Pastor Anthony our pastor teacher. That's his gift. That's what he exercises every week. Do you appreciate our pastor teacher? Are you thankful for the man that God's given us? I was hoping the applause was going to be louder because I was going to tell him he got a standing ovation, but that's close enough. Anyway, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So here, here's the way I want you to get it, okay? So this is where the pastor teacher preaches and teaches from on a weekly basis, okay? God called him. God gifts him. God gives him a message. He shares it with us. Now look at verse 12. Why does God give him messages? For the perfecting 
or the maturing of the saints. That's you. Okay? Did you know you were a saint? Did you know that? You know those ones that you used to look at all the time? Unless they got saved, they weren't saints, okay? Then, then they could be, but you're a saint. And I know I don't like to use that term very often because of what it means, and I don't live up to it more than I do. So, but I am, because God says so, and so are you. Okay. The idea for us is to live up to what we've been called to do. Okay. So, he gives us those to mature the saints. Now, look at what he says. To do, here's, this is the way it literally reads, to do the work of the ministry. So he teaches so we can mature the saints in order for them to do the work of the ministry. Some people have it mixed up. They think the preacher is the one that's paid to do all the work, so we expect them to do it all. And you know what? I, I, I saw this the other day. The churches that are dying, listen to this. The churches that are dying, and there are plenty of them are, and I hate that, hate it with a passion. But the chief characteristic of the churches are dying is where the church has allowed the pastor to be the one-man show in the body. And because we're not training people to do the work of the ministry, the pastors are worn out, some of them depressed, some of them bow down with the, le the level of their work, and they can't keep up the level anymore. So the idea is, you preach it, you mature them, and the mature, the ones who are maturing, doesn't say you have to write, the mature ones are the ones that are go out and to do the ministry with the, with the saints. To equip them, it says in the end, you, you notice the last phrase there, the last phrase there in verse 12, for the edifying or the building up of the body of Christ. So this, this is how it starts starts there, goes there, goes here, and we train people how to do the work of the ministry, and then as they do the work of the ministry, they disciple others to do the same thing, and then they disciple others to do the same thing until instead of just one man carrying the load, it's dispersed, and everybody in the church is feeling whatever their ministry is to impact others. Now, let me tell you something. i got to be real honest with you. Some of you are new, and I'm not talking to you. But some of you have been saved long enough that you need to get moving. Can I just say it real soft? You need to get moving. There's something here you can do. How many times does Pastor Anson say that? Like every week. You know, my question is sometimes, what's the, what's the stall? What, what, what's going on with you? I'd like to interview some of you. And I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot. But there's got to be, and some of it's our fault. Some of it, we have just been content to do it ourselves. Well, I can't find anybody, so I'm just going to do it. And sometimes we don't do a good job at training people. I'm not, it's not all on you. I just want you to know that. I'm not beating up anybody today. I'm just saying. Could it be that you're feeling that nudge from the Holy Spirit about something, and you're still arguing? I did. He stayed right on me. You ever notice that? He stayed right on me. He said, excuse me? Did you miss the first direction on that? I'm, I have a place. I got people. And do you know what? He's got place and he's got people for you. I couldn't do it. You don't know. You've never said, Lord, I surrender all. I'll do whatever you want me to do, whenever you want me to do, however you want me to do it. Here I am. Have at it. I'm your servant. Just like Josiah hit the floor, we ought to be hitting the floor and saying, God, you're nudging me. I'm going to step out in faith. I'm even going to join a small group. Oh, no. We just had a Holy Ghost revival in this place right here. You got, are you really? Come on, Pastor. Are you really asking me? Come on now, are you really asking me to walk out that door and go sit at a table and a room and discuss the Bible? Are you really asking that of me? That's over the top. Can you tell I was exaggerating a little bit? 
I mean, we got people around this world that are giving their lives for the sake of the gospel, not blinking an eye, and we can't get people to go sit in a room and discuss the Bible. What is wrong with us? Seriously, I've been here eight, nine, ten. I can't even keep, keep with them. I've been, I've been scratching my head. You know, that's why I'm in this position. But I've been scratching my head for that long trying to say, what in the world do you have to do to get people to move? Come on, man. We don't know how much time we got. We don't know. We need to be prepared. God's going to give you some people when you start asking. Do you believe he can do that for you? You got a testimony? You know how you got saved? Then tell somebody. God's got somebody for you. Oh, I don't know what they, what they might say if I really brought that up. It's not on you. It's on him. And if he told you to do it, he takes care of the... Con- I love Dr. Stanley's statement. Obey God and leave the consequences to him. Can you imagine what a revolutionary truth that would be if God's people just did that? Okay, Lord, I don't know how, I don't know when, and I don't know what, but you told me to do it, and it's up to you. It's on you now. You know what that does for you? Mm, Takes a lot off. Father, we thank you today for your goodness, and we thank you for your kindness to us. And we thank you that you have a plan for us, for us. And that you are interested in us because you are interested in people. You love people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that there was a person in our lives who obeyed you and shared their testimony or whatever with us and we're in the family today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The only thing better than that, Lord, is being one of those ourselves. And we want to be that. We believe you have a plan. We believe you have something that you want. Lord, I'm praying that we would rediscover your word, rediscover what you have given us, the promises. And Lord, help us to move. Help us to get moving. Help us to start praying every single day Not if, but who is it today? Who is it today, Lord? What is it today? Help me to obey. You know I'm going to be afraid. You know I'm going to argue. You know I'm going to back down. Lord, I'm trusting you to do it through me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Use me. God, use me or I'll die. I can't stand being dormant anymore. I want to see your spirit at move in my life. Are you there? Is that your heart's desire today? How many of you are praying and saying, Pastor Gary, that's what I want. I want a fresh, new touch from heaven. I want the anointing of the spirit of God. I want the filling. I want to be used. I want to impact somebody else's life. God knows it. If you don't want it, don't raise your hand. But you're saying today, by the grace of God, I don't want to know, I don't know what all is involved. I don't know what will be the ask, but I can do one thing. By the grace of God, I can surrender and say, Lord, use me. If that's your heart's desire today, if God's been working in your heart and he's working in your heart today, and you'd say, pray for me. Pray for me. That's my heart. Would you slip up your hand? God, use me. Any way you see fit. I know you got a plan. I know you got a place. Even if you're already busy, you say, I I want it all. I want everything he's got for me. Raise your hand and let me pray for you. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you today that you are ready to do something beyond what we might ask or think. Lord, I'm joining today. My hand was up. I'm praying with those who raised their hand today. Lord, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to get me moving, whatever it takes to make me a blessing to someone else, Lord, do it. Do it. Help me. Help me to say yes. Whatever it is, help me to say yes. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Don? Amen. amen. Was that a good message from Pastor Gary today? Amen.